In the last video, we discussed views of the aortic valve, emote, color emote, how to see or visualize aortic stenosis with the help of emote and the aortic regurgitation. And we talked about the measurements of the tricuspid valve by means of color Doppler and evaluating tricuspid regurgitation, but also measuring continuous wave Doppler to identify a possible existence of pulmonary hypertension. In this video, we will focus first on the pulmonic valve and the pulmonic trunk. Now we need this specific view. You have seen this view in the previous videos. If you do not remember, simply click the box up there. So what do we do with this view of the pulmonic valve and the pulmonic trunk and the RBOT? Well, we can measure, for example, the pulmonary acceleration time. The pulmonary acceleration time is this time interval over here. You see, this is where right ventricular systole starts and until you reach the peak, a certain time interval passes. And that's the pulmonary acceleration time. And depending on age, the normal value is above 100 to 120 milliseconds. So this would be a normal example of a pulmonary acceleration time. If the Doppler signal is optimally aligned, you can also perform optimal measurements. Sometimes it's not that clear, so you have to perform several measurements or just save several beats to measure it just several times. In this case, again, you see a normal pulmonary acceleration time. On the other hand, you see here a reduced pulmonary acceleration time. Here it is in between 80 to 100 milliseconds, so approximately 86, 88, so I would say 87 just lies in the middle here. So when you have this kind of measurement, it's definitely reduced. What does this tell you? This gives you the information that pulmonary hypertension can be present. If it is more reduced, so below 80 milliseconds, it's definitely reduced. We see here 66 milliseconds, and here it is below 60 milliseconds and is severely reduced. So the lower the shorter the pulmonary acceleration time is, the more likely it is that actually pulmonary hypertension is present. You cannot differentiate the grading, so you cannot say it is for sure a severe pulmonary hypertension, but you can say that it is more likely present the shorter the pulmonary acceleration time actually gets. Furthermore, you cannot differentiate in a primary or secondary pulmonary hypertension, but you can again get the information that this might be the problem of the patient. You can do the same in a peristonal long axis approach. This is an atypical view of the peristonal long axis where we do have a certain degree of pulmonary regurgitation. I would say it's mild to moderate and you can measure the pulmonary acceleration time here as well. And you see three measurements, all three are a little bit different overall you see that pulmonary acceleration time in this case is mildly reduced. So it's definitely severely reduced. And this we can display with several measurements because it's not always that easy and it's not always as clear where to measure. Another measurement we can perform is when we grade pulmonic regurgitation. So with pulmonary regurgitation, we can measure the pressure half time. It's the same with the aortic regurgitation. You measure the downslopes or the downfall of the curve. And if, it's, and if this measurement is below 100 milliseconds, it's severe regurgitation. In this case, it's approximately 300 milliseconds. So that's definitely not a severe pulmonic regurgitation, but we can also see that already in the color Doppler image. Again, here's the limitation that this signal is sometimes very hard to get and very often it's not as easy as you might want it to perform it. So if you have a truly relevant regurgitation, then it's definitely important to perform this measurement. But again, then it will be way easier compared to simply mild regurgitations. Continuing with the mitral valve, we have to remember the next view is the view of the mitral valve, the anterior and the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And we do see a color emote study of mitral regurgitation. 
This is also a case we already have seen before where we did say that this problem is around the P2 segment, so the posterior mitral valve, the mid or the middle segment where we have MR and with color M mode imaging you can see the opening of the mitral valve and here would be the closed mitral valve but here we have turbulent flow resembling mitral regurgitation. We can also use the parasitic long axis view and M mode to display the mitral valve. So here you see the mitral valve. This is the aortic valve to a certain degree. This is the tricuspid valve already, the interventricular septum, the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the left atrium. This is the pericardium and this can be seen also in this M mode study. You see here the pericardium. This is the interventricular septum. This is the right ventricle. So you also see the tricuspid valve moving, but we can focus here on the mitral valve. And this is definitely a pathological movement. We can display this already in the B mode image where we do see a reduction in the opening of the mitral valve, but not due to stenosis. So it's not mitral stenosis we are seeing, but it's probably severely reduced left ventricular function. And we again have this premature closure of the valve. We do see it over here and in the M mode measurement. Another measurement you can perform in M mode are the left ventricular dimensions. You see here the M mode measurement, but be aware as soon as we have reduced image quality, or in this case, the lung is blocking our field of view, we cannot see anything of the heart, even though we have an image in B mode, so we can differentiate the heart still in B mode imaging, but we do see here the systole of the left ventricle and diastole of the left ventricle. We do see that the interventricular septum is probably thickened as well as the inferolateral wall. For M mode, as in many views or measurements in echocardiography or in ultrasound overall, image quality is simply the key. So if you have optimal image quality, your images will be very good if you have a reduction in image quality or artifacts or the lung just shadowing your field of view you will have a reduction in image quality and also a reduction in quality in your measurements so always be aware of that and try to focus on the optimal b mode image overall you can perform several m mode studies this is a post-processing of anatomical m mode you can see the aorta so the aortic valve measured in the middle with the aortic box and this is the left atrium here, you have the right ventricle to a certain degree. This is the measurement of the mitral valve, the cavity of the left ventricle, the interventricular septum, posterior lateral wall and the pericardium. And this is a measurement at the mid-level, at the peristernal short axis of the left ventricle, where we do see the posterior lateral wall, here the septum and of course here less of the right ventricle. Overall, I never mentioned Teichholz or fraction shortening. While the Teichholz formula and fraction shortening are ways you can measure the left ventricular function, so left ventricular ejection fraction by Teichholz. This overall is not recommended by the guidelines and we do not perform it in our echo lab as M mode holds several limitations and it does have several pitfalls. First of all, you need an optimal alignment. So if your M mode is not optimally aligned, you will not be able to get the segments you want and you will have wrong measurements. You only measure two segments, so normally a part of the septum and a part of the inferolateral wall. And I cannot mention it enough, you need optimal image quality. But mode still can give you additional information even though it's not mentioned in the guidelines. And especially for the evaluation of the valves, I sometimes like to use it and especially color emot images give a very nice feeling of what the regurgitation or the stenosis actually looks like. And it also simply gives a better understanding of what's actually going on. Now, this already concludes the part of the peristernal short axis views. Soon we will continue with the apical, the subcoastal and the suprasternal views. So stay tuned.